Good evening, everyone. I'm just coming now from uh, Houston, Texas. I had a very long uh, lecture there last night in the RCC of uh, Houston, in English. Full house we had, Baruch Hashem. Three, maybe three and a half hours, American people sitting, some of them, you never believe, you know, they would sit in a Torah lecture three and a half hours. Sometimes you take a yeshiva guy that learns all day Gemara in the hardest way, and you ask him to sit in a lecture three and a half hours, <laughs> he won't even believe you're asking him such thing. I remember one time in a seminar, I gave a four hours lecture, four hours, Motzei Shabbat, Saturday night. And Rabbi Igal Chaim with me, we were in a seminar together. So he sat four hours there in the back. He told me it's the first time in my life I participated in a, in a class that took four hours straight. It's not common. I once had a lecture 12 hours from 8 o'clock in the evening until 7.30 in the morning in Ocean Park way in Brooklyn. Maybe that's a history record. Maybe, I don't know. Straight, no break. Not short, regular night. And the interesting part of that lecture was that half of the people were sitting on the floor. There's not enough chairs. So they're sitting on the floor, leaning on the wall. You know what it is to sit on a hard floor 12 hours? <laughs> When I came out, it was sunny, bumper to bumper to Brooklyn, to Manhattan, on Ocean Parkway. So Baruch Hashem, other than dripping sweat over there non-star, because the humidity over there, it's beyond, beyond any description for someone like me, it was boiling in general. Maybe it was an opportunity to erase many of the, of the past scenes. Anyway, so I arrived about an hour and a half ago. And uh, it, wasn't really, it wasn't in my mind what to talk about, so we'll talk about the parasha, parashat Naso. Tomorrow night, Shavuot, the night of Shavuot, tomorrow night. 49 day preparation for Matan Torah. 49 days, that's the last 24 hours. Preparation for Matan Torah, last 24 hours. Tomorrow night is the minhag, the custom of Am Israel is that we stay up all night. I know some places it's hard for the people, so they learn a few hours. They learn a few hours, then they sleep a little bit, and then they come back to the shul. It's not so good. It's better to sleep tomorrow afternoon, better to sleep tomorrow afternoon for three, four hours if you can. Take a day off or half a day off. Sleep and you'll be fresh for the night. We learn, let's say for about 11, 11 after the meal, after the Yom Tov meal. And then we stay all the way to five in the morning. I mean, the, the nets is five something. We're done by seven. Then we come home, we do a quick kiddush with the dairy meal. This is the, the way we do it. There's different ways to do it. Some people do the dairy meal the night before the learning. So we do, we do a dairy, dairy meal quickly, like some cheesecakes and cheese bureka and some slices of cheese and cream cheese, whatever you like, with, with hamotzi, and then we go to sleep. We sleep for about six hours, we get up, then we do a meal besari, you know, like meat and the rest of the things. Some people, the way they do it, they start, they do in the night, tomorrow night, they will do dairy, then they pick up the tablecloth, the, the nylon, the plastic, they rinse their mouth, they brush their teeth, whatever, and then they start a besari meal, and the same meal. And then they do Birkat Amazon and they finish the meal, thank you. So this is another way to do it. The most important thing tomorrow night is not to joke. It's not a picnic, it's a Torah learning. The reason we learn Torah in Shavuot every, every year, 3,300 years, even though this Minak probably started later on a later date, but 
The reason we do it, because the nation of Israel were not 100% serious when Hashem gave the Torah, instead of waiting and just counting the second, some of them went to sleep. You're about to receive a book from the creator of the world and you have the mind to sleep, how can it be? So now we're correcting what we did. The reason we eat dairy in Shavuot, when Moshe brought the Torah, they opened up the Torah for the first time and they just found out that all the meat they prepare for Yom Tov, it's all non-kosher. Because there was no rules of slaughtering and putting salt and checking all these things by the animal. They used to kill the animal and cut it and eat it, just like the Goim do. So after that, you know, when the Moshe came down, they found out, oh, the meat that we prefer for the holiday, none of it is kosher. They didn't have that much time left. So they had to go and prepare quick meals. Well, how do you prepare a quick meal? You take some milk from the sheep and the, and the cows, and you do something with that. And that's, otherwise, you have to re-slaughter the animal and take the skin off and put salt and wait a few hours until the blood comes out and until you cut it to pieces and until you cook it, 24 hours. But didn't they have man in the desert? How were they cooking it? But just when they left Egypt, they had man. No, man, man. But you see that they wanted meat, Lichvod Yom Tov. Even they had man, they still wanted meat. And plus, it's mitzvah to eat meat on Yom Tov. You should know. If you eat meat on Shabbat and drink wine, it's nice mitzvah, but rabbinical mitzvah. But if you eat meat and drink wine on Yom Tov, it's mitzvah from the Torah. That's what it means, v'samachta b'chagecha. A normal, average person, when he eats meat and he drinks good wine, it makes him happy. It's a good combination. It brings his mood higher. I don't know how. I mean, I can explain that people love it. Most of the people in the world love meat and wine. If you're vegetarian, you're vegetarian. Of course, you don't have to suffer. But in general, well, one reason is because, remember, they did not have refrigerator. We have refrigerator, so we can eat meat as much as we want. We have leftover, we put it in the fridge, we eat it tomorrow. It's no problem. We can freeze steaks in the freezer and do it anytime we want. But in the old days, it wasn't like that. If you want to eat meat, it's a serious burden. You have to make sure you have enough people to eat what you're going to slaughter right now. Otherwise, it will all go to a waste. Right? So if you want to slaughter a cow, you have to make sure you have about 100 people ready to take pieces from the meat. Whether you sell it, whether you give it as a gift, but you don't want to, go, you want to, don't want to throw it to the garbage. Today you don't need people. You slaughter a cow, you take whatever you want, the rest you put in your freezer. It's no problem. Or sheep, or goat. So that's the reason why we eat dairy. We'll speak about... Parashat Naso, usually Parashat Naso comes always after Shavuot. This year was a Shana Muberet, it, changed, it, it messed up a little bit the schedule, but usually it's called, it's called, uh, you know, the Parasha after Shavuot. But the question is, we will, go, we will see soon a few of the things, few of the secrets of this period of time that we are in. So the Parasha starts. First of all, the, the parasha, the previous parasha finished, lirot kebela et kodesh vemetu. The last word of the last parasha is, and they died. And we know in the Torah, in Judaism, you never finish any subject with a tragedy or something bad. If you read something and it finish with a tragedy, you repeat another verse one more time, that it would not finish with something bad. You always finish with good. This is a rule. So that's why sometimes we read Aftara. There's in one, after, one of the Aftarot, it says, This is the way it finish. And then we add another Pasuk that we won't finish with that. What does it mean? Go, come and see of the, the bodies of all the criminal Jews who betrayed me how the worms eat their body and the fire of Gehenom does nev never goes down on them. This is what the Pasuk of the prophets, for what's going to be the end of the wicked people. So when we finish the Aftarah with this verse, right away we repeat, This is the parasha, I believe, of, of the Chodesh. So right after that, we repeat another good Pasuk. We don't want to finish with the fire of Gehenom fire of hell for, the, for, for Jews. I don't want to finish the Aftarah like this. So we had another verse. But over here, 
It's very strange. The Torah finished the parasha. We see the parasha finish exactly with this pasuk. Bamidbar. We start the Sefer Bamidbar. First parasha is Bamidbar. Finish with this word, Vametu, and they died. So the answer is, what happened? Many people do not know that in the old days, we did not finish to read the Torah once a year. It was spread over a period of three years. So which means, in general, every parashat Shavua, the, the, the parasha of the week, was a third of what it is now. You do Shnai Mikra and Shnai Mikra and Chad Targum, you know it's a major difference. Instead of an hour and a half, it may take you half an hour. Understand? So, it used to be, today what we did, we divided it to 54. But in the, in the old days, they divided it to 175. So each parsha of the Torah was shorter. So really, when they divided it, they wrote where the parasha start and where it finish, and they gave it a name. Parashat Ba'alotcha, start here, finish here. They say two words from the pasuk, two words from the last pasuk. And they wrote, Nasa, Naso. They wrote Naso. There's only one problem, there's two Naso in a parasha. So they, they got mixed. They took the wrong Naso. That's what made Parashat Bamidbar finish with a tragedy. It was supposed to go a little bit further, finish with a good end, and then a second Naso. So which Naso? Naso et Rosh Bnei Ke'at. That's what they meant. But the divider, he went with what he had in his list. It's two Naso. He didn't pay attention. So he cut the parasha between Bamidbar and Naso in a wrong place. That's the only place, to the best of my knowledge, that you find a subject that we learn or read that finished with death or something bad. By the way, you should know, this parasha is the longest parasha in a Torah. Sometimes we read two parashot, two, and they're still shorter than this parasha alone. It has 176 verses. Also, the book of Tehillim, uh, chapter 119, also have 176 verses. And also, the Masechet Baba Batra, in the Gemara, it's the longest Masechet from all the Masechtot of the Shas, of the Gemara, also 176 pages. 176, 176, 176. As I started to explain, this Shabbat called Shabbat Acharei Shavuot. Like we have Shabbat Agadol, people say Shabbat Agadol uh, Shalom, right? They had the Gadol. Over here, they used to say, Shabbat Achare Shavuot Shalom. Don't look at this year that it came before Shavuot. Ninety-something percent of the time it comes after Shavuot. So the question is, why we should not call other Shabbatot that come after Pesach and Sukkot, Shabbat Achare Pesach Shalom, Shabbat Achare Sukkot Shalom? Why only in Shavuot they care that it comes after Shabbat? Why? You have an idea? The answer is, what's the difference between Shavuot to the other two festivals? There are three festivals, right? Shloshet HaRegalim. Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot. What's the difference? Shavuot is one day. One day only. Here we do it two days because we are in exile. Israel, one day, and finished. Pesach, still seven days. Sukkot, seven days. Pesach and Sukkot have mitzvot to do. So? Shavuot, what Shavuot is a Yom Tov without extra mitzvot, you say. There's nothing extra. No Arbat Aminim, no Sukkah, Pesach Matzah, Korban Pesach. That's one difference, right. We can say that uh, Shavuot, we, we read Megillat Rut, we do Tikkun. Okay, but Tikkun is not the Oraita. The Sfaradim, when they learn at night, they have a special Sidur. It's called Tikkun Lel Shavuot. It's parts, parts of all the Torah, 
שבכתב, תורה שבעל פה, מדרש, קבלה, זוהר, תרי"ג מצוות. It's designed that you cover all parts of the Torah. The Ashkenazim, they learn whatever they want. They learn Gemara, they learn Halacha, whatever they want. The Ashkenazim read in, uh, in Shavuot, Megillat Rut. Sfaradim don't read it. How come? Because it's in a tikkun. When we learn all night, it's already in a tikkun. We do read it, of course. It's the time of David HaMelech on Shavuot. So Megillat Rut is the Megillah, is the story in Shavuot. Why we read Megillat Rut in Shavuot? Who is the grandmother of the Mashiach? Rut. David HaMelech. David HaMelech, your site is in Shavuot. Did I tell you the story here once that uh, one uh, rabbi from Israel, he started to give lectures every Friday in a school. Ten minutes. He has a black hat, beard, and he speaks in Tel Aviv. <laughs> If you come to that school and you would not know you're in the state of Israel, you just thought, you would think you came to Manhattan or to France. The, the connection between those kids to do Judaism is basically zero. Not one percent, zero. Nothing, they don't know anything. This is the kind of kid we're talking about. So what's the connection between a rabbi like this with a beard to speak to this kind of kid? First, the question is, how do you even let him in? They don't let Orthodox rabbis to school in Israel. It's against the law. God forbid they'll tell the kids that they have to keep Shabbat. It's against the law. So what happened? So his rabbi saw that he's going to give a speech only for 10 minutes in this school in Tel Aviv. He told him first, before we talk about why it's worth it for you to go for only 10 minutes, How did you get in? That's what I don't get. So he told him, I went to the principal of the school. I told her, I want to come on Shavuot, Erev Shavuot, the day before Shavuot, and speak to the kids about the importance of Shavuot holiday. So she told me, what do you think we do here? We teach the holidays, the Jewish holidays. So he said to her, no, but you know, a little bit insight from, you know, some secrets. She said, no, I know why you want. You don't, really, you don't really want to come and teach about Shavuot. You want to come, talk to them about becoming religious, brainwash them. That's what you want to do. Rabbi, come on. So I told her, no, 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 I'm not going to speak about keeping mitzvot, nothing. Just talk about the story of Shavuot, David HaMelech, nice things, some stories. She said, okay, I can only give you 10 minutes, but it's in one condition that you sign, that, you, that I warn you and that you're not allowed to speak anything just to speak about Shavuot, and you agreed. She wants to protect her job. <laughs> so he signed. So he got into the school. So he spoke nine and a half minutes. And after nine and a half minutes, he saw he had 30 seconds left. So he said to the, to the kids, do you know who wrote the book of Tehillim? So all of them look at him like, what do you want from us now? So he said, I'll give you a hint. This is kids in Israel in our generation. Every guy know who wrote Tehillim, right? You go to Christian school, they know. You go to Muslim school, some of them would know. In Tel Aviv, state of Israel, 400 Jewish boys in elementary school, not one knew who wrote Tehillim. They understand the, the tragedy here or no? So he said to them, let me give you a hint. David, Everybody scream, Ben Gurion! <laughs> <laughs> I know it's funny, it's hard not to laugh, but we should really cry. We should really cry. You ask those kids, what's the difference between each drug? And they'll give you a two hour speech. This drug, they make it like this, that's why it looks like this. This drug, this, this drug drives you like this. Kids, 10, 12, 13 years old. The drugs, they know everything. This kind of grass, this one, this kind, this one is like this, this one is like this, this they mix like this. They're like experts in this. You ask them about cars, they tell you the size of the engine of every car, every tire, every change they made. You talk to them about sport, which player is the, has 10 goals, which one 50 goals, which one uh, won the MVP, which one is there, they know everything. You tell them who was Moshe Rabbeinu, two words they can say. 
Nothing. This is it. So it says like this. Shavuot has Tashlumim seven days after. I know I'm going, I'm going to shock you now, because you probably never heard that before. Shavuot, what happened if they did not bring the Korban of Shavuot on time? Can they bring it the next day? The answer is yes. Can I bring it the next day? Yes. How, how long? Seven days, just like Sukkot and Pesach. Technically, Shavuot is also a week. The Korbanot has Tashlumim. You know what Tashlumim means? Tashlumim means late payments. Let me give you an example. A person told his wife, wake me up for Mincha. Sunset is 8, wake me up at 7.15, then I can wash my face, make netila, and go across the street to the shul to pray Mincha. The wife was busy, and she forgot, and he opened up his eyes at 9. What happened now? That's it. Time of Mincha, it's finished. It's night already. Now he has to go catch Minyan for Arvit. When he goes to pray Arvit, because he was forced to miss Mincha, not by his fault, now he will pray Arvit twice. He finished the Shmona Yisra or Arvit, Hashem, you know, Oseh Shalom Yim Roma Avu Brachamav, right away start, Hashem Sfatai Tiftach, again. So he actually said it, the Shmona Yisra part, the Amida, twice, one after the other, and that retroactively fix missing Mincha. Same thing if he missed Shachrit, or the time passed, or he was in a hospital, or he was in a surgery, or, or whatever the case was. He prayed Mincha in the afternoon, twice, and will bring back the, the Shachrit that he lost. If he lost Arvit, in the morning, he will pray Shachrit twice, then will make it up for the Arvit that he lost. But if he missed two prayers already, he cannot get the first one back, only the second one. Only the last one, it can be paid like a late payment arrangement. This is called filat ashlumim. Sometimes a person is not sure if he has to come to pray again or not. Either he doesn't remember if he pray or not. Confused. Or he doesn't remember if he said, Ya'ale ve'yavo. So he has to repeat the tefillah, but he doesn't, he's not sure. So what do you do in a case like this? If you did say, you don't have to repeat. So you have to make a condition. You have to say, dear God, I'm going to pray again now. In case I don't have to pray, make this prayer donation prayer. Tfilat nedava. The prayers are replacement for sacrifices. All the prayers that you have, each prayer is a replacement for a specific sacrifice. Musaf of Shabbat used to be a sacrifice of Musaf on Shabbat. Musaf of Yom HaKippurim used to be a sacrifice of Musaf and Yom HaKippurim. Shachrit, it's Korban HaTamid Shel morning. Tamid means daily, all the time. Mincha, Korban HaTamid Shel Ben HaArbaim. Those, except Tfilat Arvit, which Yaakov Avinu made the time of Tfilat Arvit, but Tfilat Arvit for a while was Rishut. wasn't an obligation. But later on, it became an obligation, like all the other Jewish customs. Once the entire nation does it, it's become a certainty, chazaka. But in general now, there are also sacrifices that people used to bring as donation. No obligation. I don't have to bring a sacrifice. Some person did not make a scene. He did not violate Shabbat accidentally. He doesn't have a reason to bring. So what does he do? He brings it as donation. It's called Korban Nedava. Same thing over here. If you're not sure if you have to repeat the prayer or not, so you say, let it be, in case I don't have to, let this one be Nedava. Why you have to say it? You don't want to say the same to prayer twice. It's Brachot Levatala. Even though the Gemara say, Alevai v'yeh adam mitpalel kol hayom. The Gemara say, sometimes there are people, what we call in Hebrew, Chachmologim. You know what Chachmolog means? You don't know by now? Wise, wise guy. Thank you very much. Wise guys. Our nation is full of wise guys. Tarte mashma. Some, we really wise. But we sometimes think we're wiser than what we really are. So what happened here? 
So some people say, oh, how long are you praying? It's bitul Torah. Praying too long. Cut a little bit, pray faster. Do a quick one, two, three, that you can learn an extra hour a day Torah. Technically, there's really nothing wrong by saying it, because Torah is the highest level. But between you and I, the people who complain about how long the prayer is, we really think that they're missing Torah. I prove to you that they don't. Why? Because when they finish to pray fast, when they go to a fast minyan in a shul, what do they do when the minyan finished? They schmooze around for 20 minutes, half an hour. What happened to the Beatle Torah? If it was for Torah, they would run like crazy to the, to the books, no? This is the way Chacham Ovadia Yosef was. He did not waste a minute. If somebody wanted him to be sandak, they come, he said, first of all, you have to do the Brit in my home. That I don't have to schlep around, I don't have time to waste. Sandak, it's chut gdola to be sandak. So they bring the baby to his shul. They have to pray by him. As soon as they pray finish, five minutes, the Brit is over. No music, no Bukharian dancers, nothing. One, two, three, bring the baby. runs to his books. It's nice to talk around, to talk to people, to meet friends. How are you? Where have you been? Of course, this is the way the answer arise. You know, yesterday they announced in Israel the will of Chacham Ovadia Yosef. He left a will, but it wasn't a regular will. Will, when a person leaves a will in Hebrew, it's called tzava'a. Tzava'a comes from the word letzavot, ordering what to do with my money after I die. But his, it, wasn't, it wasn't really a will. It was instructions to his right-hand man lawyer that everything he gave to one of his sons, it's matana michaim. No one can challenge it. It was basically a declaration. It wasn't really a will. They said it's a will, but it really wasn't a will. It's called declaration. What's the declaration? He has 11 kids, boys and girls, and he gave everything to his youngest son. And Baruch Hashem, he was very, very wealthy man. And of course, the people in Israel, out of hate for religion, the connection between them and honesty is zero. So they started to say, Rabbis, where do they have this money? They're all crooks. You know how they are. How he has money? Very simple. He sold millions of books. He makes a few dollars on every book. Here you go. You already have tens of millions of dollars. You don't have to be a genius to do the math. Every Jewish home in the world has his books. By the Sfaradim, for sure. By the Ashkenazim, also half. They have their own rabbis, but... Many Ashkenazim has his books. So he wrote so many books, and he sold millions of those books, or hundreds of thousands of each, give it a few dollars of each to his account, here you go. Plus, when you become such a holy, big Tadmid Chacham, the rich people stand online to give you money. This is what the Gemara says. Everyone who gives his life for the Torah when he's poor, don't worry. You would not leave the world before you do the same thing out of wealth. Guarantee. Rabbi Akiva was very poor when he went to learn 24 years. So poor, his wife didn't have anything but straw. And when Rabbi Akiva laid her on six different sources, he became a multi, multi millionaire. Very, very wealthy. The wife of the Caesar converted. Her husband died, so she took all the wealth of the Caesar and gave it to him. He found the treasure. His father-in-law was the richest guy in Israel. After he made a ban on his daughter that she merits a complete ignorant, after 24 years when he came back and he saw that his son-in-law is the biggest chacham in the world, perhaps in the history, the biggest chacham in the history, not only in, the, in that generation. So obviously it shows that his neder, his vow, was invalid. Why there's a rule when you make a vow that if the, at the time you made a vow, one important detail you did not have, the vow cannot be valid. Because you made a nether based on false information. But obviously, if you could have known that that would be, 
the Chacham asked you this question, he said, of course, if I would, they asked him, he, he didn't know he's his son-in-law. He didn't recognize him after 24 years. So he, he told him, if you would know that your son-in-law, that your, that your daughter married to, one day will learn Torah, would you still put her in a band? So of course not. Even if you know a little Torah, I wouldn't. But if she went and married someone who clean horses, doesn't know Aleph Bet, doesn't know anything from his life. So after that, he said, I'm your son-in-law. Right away, he gave him half of his wealth, which was a lot of money. So six different sources, Rav Rabbi Akiva became wealthy. Rav Chacham Ovadia Yosef, most of his life wasn't rich. The stories of the old days in Jerusalem, before Israel became a state, there were Jordanians over there, British. As the, they didn't have money for the bus. We hear the stories that his father took him from the yeshiva to, to work in a grocery to cut cheese. They had a little tiny grocery store. A very poor, everyone was poor. They lived out of, the situation was very bad in those days. So now their eyes is how much money the Chacham has. Instead of say, Baruch Hashem, that's the right way that Hashem gave him. That's, of course, that's not his reward. His main reward is in Olam Abba. Nobody perhaps learned more Torah than him in this generation. Non-stop, Torah, Torah, Torah. So now the rise is how much money he left. But the question now, everyone begins to talk. What kind of father gives his money to one son? I don't understand how people are so dumb to even dare to talk about other people's private business. First of all, what is it their business? A father wanted to give one of his sons all the money, or one of his daughters. What is it your business? That's his money. He earned it in a nice way, in a kosher way. He can do whatever he wants. He can donate it to the shul. He can give nothing to his children. He can divide it equally, or he can give, give it to one. Now, why do you think if a person give all the money to one of his kids, why do you think it's coincidence? He was drunk. There's a reason for it. Why do you know what this kid did for him? Maybe this kid made all the money. He lived with him for more than 20 years. He lived with him. He took care of him. Him and his wife had no life. The house is like a train station. Try to live with your family and your children next to an old man, Gdolador. You have to take care of him. You have to do his shopping. You have to do his laundry. You have to make him food. And he has a special diet because he wasn't very healthy in his age. And non-stop people come to your house around the clock, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You have no privacy at all for 20 or something years. That's alone enough to, get, to give you everything he gave. That's alone. Besides knowing all the other details. This is the way the world is. Everyone pushes his nose to other people's business. Nobody knows the detail, but they don't have any mercy. They take the pen and write criticism and murder. And later, a month or two later, they find the details. They feel stupid. But of course, they won't publish an apology. The damage is done. And that's why when these people would die, there is no end to their punishment. If you speak again, a simple Jew, regular Jew, Jew you speak Lashon Ara about him and you publish it to the world, you're a very miserable person. How are you going to fix it? But if you speak about a rabbi that is especially so big, that made so many things, such an impact on the Jewish world, and there's no end to his merits, no end. You cannot count how much merits this person has. You would stand a million years and count how much Hashem owes him, you won't finish. And you dare to talk against him, you little puppet that don't have two mitzvot in your pocket? This is such a stupid world. It's incredible. But that's where we live. What can we do? We have to be very careful. I always say, when you want to make a mistake, make sure it's not going to be a mistake that will bury you for eternity. We all make mistakes. Choose your mistake carefully. Some people you don't mess with. You write one comment against Rav Yashiv or Rav Shach or who knows who, and you finished. Who knows how many millions of years you suffer for it? What do you think? Hashem will forgive you? And if you did it, as long as they're alive, you have to go even a thousand times. That's the halacha. A thousand times to go on your knees to beg him for forgiveness. And, I, and if he didn't, you still have to go. There is no dismissal. Regular Jew, up to three times you go. Moshe, forgive me, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. No, I don't want to forgive you. Goodbye, get out of here. You come again after a week. Moshe, forgive me, please. No, get out of here. 
come after another man. Moshe, please, don't be cruel, forgive me. No, okay, three times you tried, you're done. Chacham, a thousand times is just the beginning. You don't, you don't finish. This is an obligation from the law. <laughs> so why open the mouth? Why did it give you that sentence? Did you get money? No. Anyway, you do it like a coward with an anonymous name on the internet. So fame you didn't get. All the wicked people did not plow to you, right? So that one. Money you didn't make. And you destroyed your eternity. There's any bigger fool than that? Find me a bigger fool than that. When people make scenes, they want to benefit from the scene, no? Delicious food. No, at least I did. An avera with a woman. No, at least he did something. Later on, he regrets it. But he feels he got something. At least he got something for the punishment that he's getting now. But over here, what did he get? Nobody knows it's him. So the wicked people do not appreciate him. Money he did not make. And now he lost his eternity. Or do you think it's a joke? He lost from all directions. Definitely he did not get anything. Like a snake. Like a snake. That's why the Shonara is, is attached to the snake. Snake is the symbol of the Shonara. So, up to seven days. Now, this is the question. There, in Bet HaMikdash, there used to be a special table with shelves. It's called Lechem Apanim. It makes 12 chalas. According to Kabbalah, when you do Kiddush, you don't do two chala, you do 12. The Kabbalists, they have 12 rolls. Many Iraqis and Bukharians in this generation, they want to become Kabbalists. So they imitate the Kabbalists. All of a sudden, you see, they have two little tefillin together. They do a lot of things, like the Benishchai. Fine. If they make them happy, fine. But one way or the other, the custom comes from this custom that they used to have in Bet HaMikdash. But the miracle with this bread that all week it stayed warm. Imagine you have bread, just like it came from the oven. How long does it take to the bread to become cold? 20 minutes, no? You come after four days, you touch it, crispy, warm. You come after seven days, when they replace it, and before they eat it, it's still warm. They put the new one, and they take the old one, and it's still warm. So it says like this. When they, on Shabbat, when they took off the old bread, it was still warm, and it was a miracle. In Pesach and Sukkot, when the holiday is seven days, you can see the miracles. The bread, until the end of the holiday, it's still warm. People see the miracle. But in Shavuot, if you put the bread, and then a few hours later you take it, it doesn't look such a big miracle. Same day, OK, no, it's fresh. What do you want? It was, it was done today. Now, it's not like seven days later. So they used to take it off after the Shabbat, after Shavuot. That's why they, and this was there, Parashat Naso. That's why they call this parasha, parasha after Shavuot. So they used to do it, taking the Lechem Apanim, the Shabbat after Shavuot. And like I said, Shavuot has Tashlumim seven days. In reality, by the way, you should know, because of the light of receiving the Torah every year, there's a spiritual light in the world now. It starts in Rosh Chodesh Sivan, and it finishes on Yud Bet in Sivan. That's why we do not do Tachnun, no confessions in the prayers, from the beginning of Rosh Chodesh Sivan until Yud Bet. But it's four or five days after Matan Torah. We still don't do it. We finish Matan Torah. The holidays finish. Still four or five days after, you don't do Vidui. Why? There's still some light. From, the, from these events that changed the face of history. Somebody asks you, what's the most important event in the history of this world? The, the day of, of accepting the Torah. Yetziat Mitzrayim was very important. The miracles that happened in Mitzrayim was very important. Entering Eretz Israel was very important. Building the first Bet HaMikdash was very important. There's a lot of important events. In modern days, what in modern days, Jews finally went back to Israel after 2,000 years. It's very important. The Arabs all attacked us. In six days, we defeated all of them combined. That was a very special miracle that Hashem made for us. 
there's, there's a lot of important events. None of those events come near the day that Hashem made this covenant and gave us the Torah. In Teilim, when we do Hallel, when we sing the Hallel, in two days you're going to remember it. Not tomorrow, the next day in the morning. When we read the Hallel after Shachrit, we say like this. David HaMelech wrote, Bet Aaron barchu et Hashem. Bet HaLevi barchu et Hashem. Nachon? Bet Yisrael barchu et Hashem. Irei Hashem. Irei Hashem. It doesn't say Bet Irei Hashem. When it comes to Kohanim, Bet Aaron. Leviim, Bet HaLevi. The nation of Israel, Bet Yisrael. All of a sudden, something that doesn't look belong there. You wanted to say Kohanim, Leviim, and Israelites, I got the point. That's why you say Bet. Bet means house, the house of the Kohanim, the house of the Levites, the house of the regular Jews. Fine. Well, well all of a sudden he pushed, Ire Hashem, Baruch Et Hashem. Why he didn't say Bet? Bet. You say Bet, Bet, Bet. Say also Bet in the fourth one. Or don't mention the fourth one at all because it doesn't belong there. You get the question or no? So it says like this. If a person wants to be a Kohen, can he do? He can't. One person came to the rabbi, he said, Rabbi, I want you to make me a Kohen. So the rabbi said, come on, what does it mean I want you to make? He cannot be a Kohen. So rabbi, you know everything can be solved with some cash, no? How much? <laughs> Say the price. The rabbi said, listen, very nice try, like they say in America. Nice try. <laughs> go, go somewhere else. So he said, Rabbi, 5,000 is enough? No, no, my friend. Go out, go out. 10, 10. All right, 10? Say, no, no, no. Out, out. But why? The rabbi got curious. Why it's so important for you to be Kohen? It's no bit Mikdash today. Well, it's only headache to be Kohen today. Take your shoes off, <laughs> wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get korbanot, you don't make money, you don't make masrot. You only do. You don't get anything as Kohen today. No, they give you aliyah here and there. Seder. Why you want to be a Kohen? He said, I tell you, my father was a Kohen, my grandfather was a Kohen, I also want to be a Kohen. <laughs> I wonder if this story really ever happened. <laughs> so, I have, um, over the years, very foolish questions that people ask me. I mean, I, the only reason I didn't collect all of them and publish the book, it would be a very good seller, because I would know that when these people would read it, say, oh, that's me. <laughs> that's me. They get upset. <laughs> no, I don't want to do it to them. But technically, if I would publish it and people would read the question, they would laugh. It would be such a hilarious book. You see, some of the questions that people ask, I myself hold my laugh. But then I, then I become very upset after that. I say, how did we get to such a horrible situation that people ask such questions? Huh? It's incredible. So it says like this, Kol ha-pikudim asher pakad Moshe ve-Aaron unsiye Yisrael et ha-leviim le-mishpachotam le-bet avotam. Bet? The house of their fathers. Everyone follow his father. Your mother is Ashkenazia. Your father is a Sfaradi. You are Sfaradi. It's the other way around. You are you Ashkenazi. Your father is Hasid. You Hasid. You follow the, the tradition of your father. Religion comes from the mother. Whatever your mother is, that's what you are. Your mother Goya, you're a Goy. Even if you have a beautiful star, David, and you speak Bukharian. Doesn't matter. You're a Goy. I had a guy like this. I had a guy like this. Not in New York. Big star David comes to me. Rabbi, the lecture was amazing. Da, da, da. And then the guy comes to me and says, what are we going to do with this guy? He's not a Jew. What do you mean he's not a Jew? So what is he doing here? His father married Goya. So, he, so he, I say to him, you know, you need to convert. Well, what's the point of keeping and doing? You're not even a Jew. You, you're wasting your time. Of course, no, help me out. What do I have to do? So I ask him, you keep Shabbat? He said, not yet. 
stay a goy, I said. What do you mean, stay a goy? It's better not to make you a Jew. Why? I make you a Jew to become a criminal. Better you stay a goy. You don't have to keep Shabbat. You're not a criminal. But I cannot be a goy. I grew up like a Jew. I cannot marry a goya. Well, I have to marry a Bukharian like me. Ma, it's my, fam my father's side. I have nothing to do with my, 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 my mother's family. What do, you, what do you mean I have to stay, I have to stay goya? I say, very sad. What do you think? What's more important? To be a criminal or not, or to follow the tradition and the good, delicious Ashpolo? What's more important? <laughs> <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. His mind now, how I'm going to marry someone that I cannot eat good Bukharian rice or some, you know, lamb and all the delicious food that they make. That's what he's worried about. That's going to have to eat Irish Danish. <laughs> well, we care about what you're going to eat. We care about if you be a criminal or not. When you keep all the mitzvot, come back. We'll be more than happy to help you out to convert. <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So it says like this. If a person wants to be a Kohen, he can desire it as much as he wants. It won't help him. He will not be a Kohen his entire life. There's no way to become a Kohen. You cannot convert to become a Kohen. You can convert to Judaism. But you cannot convert to be a Kohen, neither a Levi. But if a person wants to be tzaddik, righteous, even a Goy wants to be righteous, it's in his hand. It has nothing to do with his father. That's why when David HaMelech wrote, Yireh Hashem, right, Yireh Hashem, he didn't say Bet Yireh Hashem. Bet means following the fathers by, by the house of the father. It's nothing to do with your father. Your father can be a big murderer, and you can be the biggest tzaddik in the world. No contradiction. Sometimes it's the other way around. Yireh Hashem Baruch Et Hashem. Yireh Hashem, it's 100% in your hand. That's why there's no house. That's individual. It's your choice. Kohen, it's not your choice. Levi, it's not your choice. To be a Jew, it's not your choice. You're born like this. But to be a tzaddik, Yeresh Shamaim, it's 100% in your hand. That's why he took off the bet. Everything is calculated precisely. No, no coincidence. Two thieves, they robbed a bunch of merchandise. And one of them wants to do tshuva. He wants to return the stolen good. But the other one threatened him. No. I don't want. Can he return it without him knowing and have a fight with his partner to the crime? Or since you started with a crime, you cannot stick a knife in his back and give it back. What do you think is the right thing to do? Logical thing <laughs> So he comes to the rabbi, he says, Rabbi, I'm dying to return it, but my partner doesn't let. So the rabbi told him, Katuv ba pasuk in Parashat Naso, what does it say? Ve'itvadu et chatatam asher asu. Ve'itvadu means, and they confessed in plural. And they confessed the sin that they did in a plural language. And right after that, in a pasuk, in a verse, he says, Ve'eshiv et ashamo. And you return your guilt. Not plural, single. When he says to return the stolen good, he spoke in a, in a single language. To confess, to do tshuva, it spoke in plural. All the criminals have to do it. But to return, one can return without the agreements of the other. Why? Every second that it's not returned to the original owner, it's a sin for you. Your life comes before the other criminal. Save yourself. If it's messed up his, his situation, it's his problem, not yours. The right thing to do is to return it. You know, I once told a story a few years ago. There was one Hasid that he has a son that is handicapped on a wheelchair. And then uh, he got to a point that he cannot send him with a school bus anymore. So in order for the kid to go to yeshiva, this poor father didn't have that much money. He himself learns in yeshiva, he's avrech. He had to 
collect together money and buy a car that he can drive his son to yeshiva every day with a wheelchair. So he came to a place, yard, that they sell used cars, three partners, all three seculars, Israeli. And they said, so I'm looking for a car, you know, with a big trunk that I can put the wheelchair. So they told him, we have a very good car for you, this Volvo right here, perfect. Look, he has a big trunk. In the meantime, this Volvo, the engine is dead, no transmit. It will drive a day or two and go on fire. It's a lot of money, the poor guy. So now one of the partner came out and he saw the boy outside with a wheelchair. So he started to speak to the boy. He said, oh, who are you? He said, my father is trying to buy a car that he can take me to yeshiva because I cannot go to yeshiva, you know, with this wheelchair. He has no, no legs, you know. So right away, this chiloni is not religious. It felt bad in his heart. How are we going to sell this dead car to this guy two days later? He can see that they're not rich. So he felt bad for them. So he came inside, he said to the guy, you know, you don't have to get this Volvo, we have other cars. Come, let me show you other cars. So the other ones, they said, what do you mean other cars? The Volvo, it's perfect for him. Why are you mix, mixing him up? <laughs> <laughs> so he said to the car, car. So they give him an eye. This is all criminals, you know. They're not the type of guys you want to mess up with. So no matter what he does to give a hint to this Hasid, you don't want to buy this Volvo. This guy doesn't get the point. So after when he saw he's beginning to count the money, he said to him, don't buy this car. The engine is finished. The transmission is bad. The car will die in two days. They put a special liquid to make it drive another day or two. Right away, he took the money. Thank you very much. Hashem should bless you. After the Hasid ran away quickly. I don't want to tell you what happened there. Both of them started to give him punches. He's all bleeding, throwing chairs at him, messed up. And in the end, they took him to a mafia, Borer. You know what Borer means? The head of the mafia is the judge. Every day he murder one or two people, but he's the judge. <laughs> two people for breakfast, two for lunch. Now he has to decide who is right. But these criminals, they don't have exactly the word of the Torah, you know. So he said to him, listen, there's no time to be tzaddik now in this business. They had a great opportunity. A naive guy came. They could make a few thousand dollars. You have to give them their third. Third to him and a third to him. And plus, you cannot be a partner anymore in a business. You lost your share. That's the punishment he gave him. So after he kicked him out, he was trying to get a job. You cannot go against this mafia. If you show your face one day, the next day they blow your car away. You come again, they'll kill you. That's what they do. So what happened now? He went to find a job. One year, the poor guy cannot find a job. And he's also a mechanic. So he's looking for a job as a mechanic. Money has no money left. They took his partnership. After about a year, a year and a half, he saw an ad, a mechanic for a bus private bus company, mechanic for bus. He said, oh, that could be a good job. He went, interview. He see about 50, 60 people there. Everybody came with his resume. Ah, what's my chance to get a job here? He's already there. He's sitting. They call his name. He comes inside. He see 12 religious people, hats, beards. It's Haredi company. He comes inside. I said, so what do you know? So I'm a mechanic, this, that. Look at his resume. Okay, we'll let you know. He said, ah, let me know. Okay, I wasted my time here. So he comes out. Now, in his, in his whole time, his wife, which is also secular, she told him, I want you to know I'm proud of you. This is the nice thing, thing you ever did, that you did not let them sell this broken car to this Hasid with the handicapped kid. I'm proud of you. You did the right thing. He said, but we don't have what to eat now. More than a year, I cannot find a job. Why God is doing it to me? You know how people talk. She said, doesn't matter. I'm with you. We'll be poor. We'll lose the house. Doesn't matter. That was the right thing to do. Now he, he comes to get the job. Every job he goes, he can't get the job. It's very hard to find a job in Israel. It's very hard. So what happened now? He goes up to the street, the press. Then a little boy ran after him. Excuse me. 
you were just inside the office there for an interview? So yes, they asked me to call you to come back. So he came back. He walks inside and says, no, Marsha, you're wasting my time. Come back. So one of them said, tell me, let me ask you a question. You used to own a used car dealership? Ah, he's nervous, you know, how many people they tricked. So said, why, you know me? <laughs> you know, he doesn't want to say yes. He doesn't want to say no. He doesn't know if it's good or bad. Why, you know me? Yeah, you don't remember me? He looks at him. One time I came to you, I wanted to buy a car with my boy. My boy is on a wheelchair. He looks at him. You the one? <laughs> See, yes. So now he started to tell everyone in Yiddish the story, how this guy saved him and what a tzaddik he is. Don't look at him the way he dressed. Behemet, he has a good neshama. He said, I want you to know your resume is the worst out of everyone here. But because I feel that I owe you, I convince everyone here, and you got the job. Now, that only got the job. He became the manager of the place, in charge of all mechanics, buses, and other mechanics. He started to make very good money. And whatever he lost, Hashem gave it back to him from the back door. But what an, an amazing ashgacha. Some people would call it coincidence. Some people would call it good luck. There's no such thing. Coincidence, there's no such thing. Good luck. There's only one thing. That's the wish of Hashem. Whatever Hashem wanted, he put it together. Now, we have a question. Why, when it speaks about the confession, it speaks in plural? When to return, it speaks about individual language. The answer, ish or isha, shegazlu, a man or a woman that stole. So I want, they want to return. Chayavim shneim litvadot. Man has to make confess. ganavnu, gazalnu. And a woman also has to confess. No difference. But when they want to return, they want to return the stolen good. If she's wasted what she stole, she already burned it. She went to Macy's and she bought herself all kinds of nice things. Who is responsible for her action, herself or her husband? Herself. The answer, the father, the husband has a problem now. Why? Everything the woman own or earn belongs to her husband for good and for bad. If she mess up and she lose, he has to pay. If she makes money, he takes it. This is the Gemara in Gitin, page Ayin Hey. So it says, when to return, there's only one who can return it, who? The husband. The wife cannot return it. Why? She doesn't have money on her own. All the money belongs, is responsible for whatever she does, Ma damages, she, an accident she made. He has to pay someone for the damage, he has to pay for it. There's one more hint over here. To confess, it's free. Everyone agree. What do I have to do, Rabbi, to fix my sin? First step, to confess. What's confess? You say a few words and you go like this. Oh, that's no problem. What's the next step? You have to take the million dollars you stole and go and return it to the owner. Oh, that's a problem. Huh? <laughs> Don't have a way around it? To confess, everyone agree. Even the Christian, look at them. Father, 50 bucks in a thing, no problem. Sometimes the sins of this Christian is so much, so the father say, the son, 50 bucks is not enough. <laughs> you have to do better. So he said, I'm broke, father. <laughs> Why do you think I came to you? <laughs> so don't worry, son. JC will take the rest of your suffering. <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but that's the way the religion is. JC came to the world to suffer for their sin. Even though the Torah, which according to them came from the same God, say clearly, Ish bechet o yumat. Everyone is responsible 100% for his own sins only. Nobody can repent for you. Nobody can redeem you from your sins. You're the only one who made the sin, and you're the only one who can erase the sin. That's it. You and your money. 
if it really belongs to you. If it's stolen, it's also not your money. You and your money can save you. That's it. So how can JC make repentance for you? How can he take the suffering? It doesn't work. It's against the rules of the Torah. So it says like this. If you stole from someone and he died, now you have to return it to his son, but he doesn't have a son. So you have to see who inherits his money. But you don't, he doesn't have anyone. He's a Holocaust survivor, no one is there. What are you going to do? You don't know who to give it to. So it says in the Torah, if he doesn't have a saver, someone who save his money for him. Then you have to give it to the Bet HaMikdash. Kohen is the representative of Bet HaMikdash. The Gemara asks, how is it possible that a person doesn't have any relative left in the world? How is it possible? There's always somebody far, cousin, grandson, grandfather, no? Has to be somebody, brother, half-brother, somebody, you find a lot, some, some kind of a connection. So, the Gemara say, the rule in the Torah is, you go to all direction to find him, someone to inherit him. If you can't find, you go all the way back to Yaakov Avinu. And then all the Jews are children of Yaakov. So one of the sons, so basically in the end, somebody will inherit him. You can go all the way back to our mutual father, which is Jacob. That's our, all of us father. So that's what makes us all, all, all of us relatives, really, in reality. As long as there's one Jew in the world, you have someone to inherit you. In a worst case scenario, right? If only one left, Chaz Shalom. He, he's the one. If some, somewhere in a history is linking to you through the same father. You know, they made a DNA check for the Kohanim now. They found that the Kohanim, people that their last name is Kohen, they have a mutual DNA. They have one gene mutual in their, in their blood. Of course, you cannot determine who is a kosher Kohen and who is not based on this DNA. Why? Because you can get the DNA from the mother and the mother can be Bichlal Goya. You can, your last name can be Kohen and you're Goy. Doesn't matter. So if you do a DNA, you see in the blood of this uh, Goy, you see DNA of Kohen. Because it comes through the, 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 the father, but the mother is Goya Bichlal. Your father is a Kohen, or your grandfather, or... But the mother is not Jewish, so what, what, who cares that you have a DNA of Kohanim? But they, the point of this research is to show that eventually all the Kohanim came from the same father. Of course, we cannot use it for scientific purpose today to determine who is a Kohen. This is only when Mashiach comes, he'll say, you're a real Kohen, you're a fake Kohen. But after that, there's nothing else we can do. But this research showed that all Kohanim link to one person, which is incredible. So now it says like this. The Gemara say, what does it mean if Laish and Goel, we're talking about a convert. When a convert converts, he has no relatives. No father, no mother, no children, no brothers, no sisters, no grandparents, no nothing. Every convert that converted, there's no relatives. It's him and Hashem. That's it. It's very interesting. So what happened if you stole from a convert money and he died? And you come to return it and they say, oh, we're very sorry. He just passed away yesterday. How are you going to return it? You're going to go put it on his grave? So the answer is, the Gemara in Baba Kama Kuftet says, Gzelat Ager, Shemet Lelo Yorshim, Nitenet La Kohen. You stole from a convert, he dies, he has nobody to inherit him. You have to give it to the Kohen. And this is one of the 24 gifts that the Kohanim receive in the Torah. 24 gifts. The question is, right in the same Pasuk it says, But the problem is, Truma we don't give to the Kohen. Truma we give to Bet HaMikdash. 
But the Bet Hamikdash, what 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 goes to the Kohen? The Bikurim. We we bring Bikurim, Trumat shel Bikurim. We take the best fruits from that comes out of the tree, and uh, holidays we take it to Bet Hamikdash in a basket. We, the Torah said to give it to Bet HaMikdash, but who gets it? The Kohanim that sh- serve in the shift. You arrive to Bet HaMikdash Tuesday afternoon. Who are the Kohanim who serve right now over there? They are the ones who get it. They are the hands of Bet HaMikdash. If you come a few hours later, a different Kohen would be there. He is now the hand. Now what happens if you come and you see your friend is not there? He just finished his shift an hour ago. So you say, here, I'm giving it to you. Give it to my friend. Why? Well, I have to give it to the coin. I'll decide to which coin to give. In other things that we give to the coin, we can decide which coin to give it to. But over here, we cannot decide. Why? Two things from the 24 goes directly to Beta Mikdash, and Beta Mikdash decide to give it to the coin. So to which coin? To the one that was in service when the gift arrived to Beta Mikdash. Remember this rule. It's a little confusing. Huh? So that's why those two things appeared in one verse, because technically there's no communication between them. What's connection between stealing from the ger to bikurim? That they come in one pasuk in the Torah. But if it comes in one area, one next to another, that shows there's a connection between them. But it's very hard to find the connection. I just told you the connection. The connection is unlike the other 22, which you can decide which coin to give it. Over here, you don't really give it to the coin. You give it to the coin. But you actually gave it to Beta Migrash, who gave it to the coin. Who works at that shift. Who were over there in a shift. One Jew had businesses in Africa. And he wanted to send to his wife a big chunk of money. But it, could, it wasn't like today, if, uh, your Western Union, FedEx, all these things. It was in old primitive days. But he could not go to the city of Prague, Czechoslovakia, to give the money to his wife. And he has to take boats on those days. It may take weeks. So he found one person who go from Africa to, to Prague. But this person wasn't uh, an honest person. You can see he's a sleazy person. So he said to him, can you do me a favor? My wife has no money for the holiday. Give her some money. So he told him, I'm very sorry. I will only give this uh, 1,000 uh, ruble, 1,000 uh, coins to your wife, coins of gold, if I will keep as much as I want for myself, and the rest I'll give it to her. I want commission, he said. Now what can he do? He has no other messenger. He takes advantage on a situation, this messenger like some people do all the time. So he doesn't know what to do. He say, not to send her anything, it would be a disaster. So he came to the city of Prague, he gave 50 coins to the wife, and he kept 950. Imagine now you want to send money in Western Union, $1,000, <laughs> oh, your son gets 50. They keep 950, right? Anyone would use them? So he came now, he gave 50 Zerubim to the wife. But the wife wasn't a fool. She called him right away to Bedin. She know every time my husband sent, it was at least 1,000. What is he giving me 50? He stole the money. So she took him to Bedin. And there was the Noda Be'yehuda. The chief rabbi it was the Noda Be'yehuda. The story is more than 200 years ago. So the rabbi said, OK, both of you have to put the money in the box. And after my verdict, then I'll tell each one of you how much to take. So he put the 915, she put the 15. So the rabbi replaced it. He took his envelope, he gave it to her, and he took her envelope and gave it to him. I started to scream, what's going on? He said, look, the man gave me a letter with a signature with two witnesses. And he told me that I can take whatever I want. <laughs> So then Oda Yudah told him, you don't know how to read. You misinterpret the letter. What did the letter say? The letter said, the husband wrote, 
right? לאשתי. וזה בדיוק, מה זה מין? זה כמה שאתה תרצה לעצמך, תיתן לאשתי, right? So he says, the rabbi told him, he told you how much you want for yourself, take, and that's what you're going to give to his wife. That's what he said in the letter. Because you know, when you write a letter, you can translate it in two different ways. The rabbi wasn't a fool. He knew that he wanted <laughs> you want the whole money for yourself. So he gave it to her. This Noda Yehuda, one time a, a wicked person in his town died. So he ran to the funeral with Gillette, razor. Relax, there was no Gillette, but a sharp knife. He sharpened it very good. And now the body of the person is on the way to the cemetery. He, he said, hey, stop, I have to shave him. <laughs> Shaved him like this. So he said, Rabbi, what are you doing? He was in the hospital, this person, so he grew a little beard. So he, so he came, he shaved his face, mamash, like a woman face he made him. So he said to him, Rabbi, what are you doing? You're embarrassing my father, the son say. He said, why? You don't want your father to be buried in a nice, clean shave? <laughs> said, that, that's why we care. Anyway, the worms will eat him up soon. Who cares now about the beard? So the rabbi started to scream, 20 years! When he was shaving with razor, I screamed, you're not allowed, you're not allowed, none of you care. Now when it became allowed to shave with a razor, because he's dead already, now you're all screaming. The opposite world. When he was shaving with a razor 20 years, yeah, none of you care that he makes such a scene. Now when he's dead and he's not sinning, You're allowed to cut the, from, the, from the dead person. Who cares? He's dead already. You worry about it. Now, before we finish, one last thing for today. Isha Sota. Woman that did an act of prostitution. A married woman, I should say. Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe le'emor. Ish, ish, ki tiste ishto ma'ala bo ma'al le'emor. The Midrash explained, Ledorot. Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe le'emor. Every time the Torah say, El Moshe le'emor, that Hashem spoke to Moshe le'emor means to pass the message out to the nation of Israel. Over here, the Midrash say something unique. The Midrash say, for generations. But all the Torah is for generations. Why the Midrash has to say for generations? Ma, the laws of Isha Sota is for generations, but the rest of the laws of the Torah, it's not for generations? What does the Midrash mean for generations? Rav Yonatan Eifschitz, he said, in the generation of the Midbar, the 40 years that the Jewish nation were in the Midbar, the laws of Isha Sota did not apply. Woman who cheated on her husband did not exist in the desert. How does he know? How does he know? Hundreds of thousands of women. 40 years, not one of them did something. She didn't meet a guy behind the tent and uh, went behind her husband back. How does he know? How does the rabbi know that 40 years it did not happen? That's why it would only start after they entered the land of Israel. But it did not happen in the desert. The answer is, if it happened in a desert, the man used to fall every day. If a woman cheated on her husband and she went with another man, she can no longer be the wife of this man. That's it. The marriage is finished. So therefore, even if the husband wants to forgive her, even if the husband knew that she did it and closed his eyes, and some stupid husband even told her, go, go and do it, believe it or not. No matter what happened, as soon as she had relationship with another man, once, for one second even, one time, that's it, the marriage is finished. This marriage in Shamaim is cut. And if she became pregnant from another man, which is not her husband, while she was still married to her husband, the kids are mamzerim. They're illegitimate kids. And they have horrible life. They cannot get married. And it's a big problem. A 
And if they do get married, because nobody knows the mamzerim, they die young. Why? Because nobody knows that the mamzerim, so Hashem is forced to take them young. Look how many tragedies come because of something like that. But, if a woman did it in the Midbar, Hashem knows that she cannot be with her husband anymore. So every day, man for every Jew would fall right where he lives. If the woman already did that, for instance, last night, in the morning her man will not fall by her tent, it would fall by her father's tent. Should be Should of course. And no one would take the risk. What woman would do such thing? She'll go and do, and do a sin with another man, knowing tomorrow morning her man would fall by her father. The whole nation of Israel look at her and say, what did you do that your marriage is annulled? What did you do? There's only one explanation. What did she do? What? She broke the marriage. Finished. The not for the no. If a man did it, the marriage is not finished. Why? According to the Torah, a man was able to marry more than one woman. One, two, three, five, ten. He can marry other women. So he had a way to do it in a kosher way. Why a man can marry more than one woman and a woman cannot marry more than one man? Because a man, if a woman marry more than one husband, you will never know who the kids belong to. Never know. Even today when you say DNA, DNA is not 100%. There's ways to play with the DNA. There's an Israeli company who invented the way they do all kinds of things with the DNA. I have a friend, he's a judge, San Diego. One time we had together Melava Malka after Shabbat. And I told him, are you aware that today you can have DNA, that they can actually modify the DNA and put it in a crime scene and convict an innocent person? He was aware of it, but it's not coming yet. But today, basically, even DNA really is no 100% guarantee that this person is guilty problem. If there's no way to play with the DNA, it's a wonderful gift that Hashem gave us. Why? Here you go, my friend. We know. One thing we do, it's very good for the DNA, that you can prove that you are not a criminal. In other words, all these people who sit in jails, and now when they invented the DNA technology, they can come and ask, go into, go into the box with all the things from the crime scene and check. And they see that the DNA doesn't match to him. So at least they know he's, not, he's innocent. To convict a person based on a DNA, it's a problem, according to the Torah. The Torah says two kosher witnesses, not DNA. Even a camera, it's not good. If a camera shows a person murdering another person, you cannot convict him. The camera can be played on, can be edited. There's many things you can do. So now it says like this. How do you write Isha Sota in Hebrew? Sota. How do you write Sota? Samech, Vav, Tet, Hey. But in the Torah here, it doesn't say Samech. It says Sin, Shin. Shin with the dot on the left. Why Sota, Isha Kitiste, it's with Shin? Why? It, come, it hints about the word Shtut. Shtut, shote. What shote means? Shote means a fool. Shtut means an act of stupidity. A spirit of stupidity fell on that person and caused him to make that sin. En adam chote de gemara se, ela im ken nichneset boruach shtut. Logically, how a person would dare to go against the creator of the world and go against what he ordered? Logically, doesn't make any sense. But if something messed up his head for that temporary moment, that's what caused him to do the sin. We call that something Yetzirah, evil inclination. So the Torah says like this. Aisha sateta, she went away from the right direction, from the actual norma. The Torah wrote, Ish, Ish, men, men, ki tistei ishto. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, why the subject of Isha Sota 
comes right next to Trumot and Masrot. We just spoke about Truma to the Kohanim and Maser, giving 10% from your income. The wheat, the barley, the cash. So what are we talking here about? What usually when two topics in the Torah, one next to another, as I saw, as I said to you hundreds of times in the past, they are connected. Can you tell me what's the connection between a woman who cheated on her husband to the husband maaser and donation? What's the connection? The Gemara says, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, this is in Brachot Samech Gimel, Brachos, page 63. The Gemara says, "Kol sheyesh lo trumot u'maasrot ve'eno notnam la kohen." Someone who has to give truma and ten percent, ve'eno notnam la kohen, and he does not give it to Bet Hamikdash. So for she nitzrach la kohen, Hashem will force him to go to the kohen when when his wife would cheat on him, and he won't be sure if she did or not. He will have to take her to the Kohen, and the Kohen would write all the chapters that speaking about it in the Torah, all the alot, the curses, and Shem Amforash, and all the things that they write on a cloth. has to be a real cloth like a mezuzah. They put it in a water, the ink goes in, she has to drink it. If she cheated, her wounds explode, and she die on a spot. What's the name of this water? Amayim Amehararim. It comes, it's similar to the word Amayim Amarim. The Torah says clearly that this water were bitter. What made the water bitter? Technically, we think the ink. No. The Torah said that the water were bitter before the name of Hashem is erased in it, the ink. Before. Why? And you put it into the bitter water. You put the name of Hashem that you wrote, you put it into the bitter water. Hashem doesn't make mistakes, which means the water were bitter from before. What made the water bitter? It's water from, 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 from spring. It's natural water, clean, beautiful, pure. You have to take sand from the floor of Bet HaMikdash. You take some sand from the territory of Bet HaMikdash, and you put it inside, and the sand make it bitter. And after that, you put the ink inside, the ink erased. And she drinks it, and then from now we're going to know. If she did not cheat, the Kohen gives her a special blessing. If she doesn't have children, now for sure she will have children. Clear miracle. She could be barren. Now the Kohen gave her the blessing. A few months later, you can see she's, she's having kids. But it's very interesting here now, something very interesting. Why the wife has to get punished for her, uh, for her husband being stingy? The husband doesn't want to give 10% to the yeshiva or to Bet HaMikdash. Is that a reason to make his wife a prostitute? Why she has to suffer? Do you understand what Rabbi Yochanan says in the Gemara? Yeah. If you be cheap and you don't give tzedakah, to the Kohanim in Bet HaMikdash, Hashem will force you to visit the Kohen. Why? You don't know if your wife did it or not. So you would have to take her to a lie detector. Made in heaven. Lie detector, the Kohen. The Kohen will clarify if she did it or not. Now one more thing you should know. This lie detector not always worked. You can put the name of Hashem in the water, she drinks it, and she cheated, and she doesn't die. How can it be? She's not married to him. Her husband is not a tzaddik. Very good, Moshe. Baruch Hashem. It's the truth. I didn't know you'll know the answer, but it surprised me. If the husband's actions are not pure, is not a tzaddik, this water won't work on his wife. Why should we expose there and not you? You bring her when you're worse than her. It only work if you clean. Hashem wants to help you to know if you're allowed to be with your wife or not. Maybe she's not your wife anymore. But if you yourself are not good, so what's the point here? So it says like this. Why this woman has to pay for being 
married to such a stingy person that she's going to end it up doing such an act? The answer is, En mezavgim lo la'adam zivug ela lefi ma'asav. A person does not marry somebody else by coincidence. It's decided precisely. You get what you deserve. You get what you deserve. When Hashem saw you a stingy guy, He found you a woman that will be a prostitute one day. Or when Hashem saw that you're a prostitute girl, He found you a guy that will keep the money that he has to give to Bet HaMikdash in his pocket. So now it's very interesting. Rav Yosef Kolon, the student of the Maharil, one of the Gdole Aposkim, he wrote something very interesting. There was a question that they asked him about a woman who did that. But the woman said, I'm very sorry, Rabbi. That may be one of the things that I can put in my book. She said to him, Rabbi, I didn't know it's not allowed. <laughs> I didn't know it's not allowed. Is it considered shogeg or mezid? Person comes and says, why you plow the ground on Shabbat? Why, it's not allowed, Rabbi? Not allowed. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. You cannot execute him. Maybe he didn't know. What? There's a, there's a doubt. Maybe he didn't know. It's not a Talmud Chacham. Tomorrow, next Shabbat, you see him riding. What are you doing on Shabbat? You're riding. Why, it's not allowed? Not allowed. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. If you catch him riding again, you execute him. You catch him plowing the ground again, he cannot say, I didn't know, because you told him already, you gave him warning. But as long as he keeps coming with new sins, and every time you catch him, you say, I don't know, you have to give him the benefits of the doubt. Maybe this woman, the same thing. How do you know? Maybe she's so dumb, she never heard. <laughs> it's not it's given. Well, it's a logical thing. It's a logical, it's logical, logical thing to do. A logical thing, right? Why? Today, the logic of the goyim is to do it as much as they can. Just don't get caught. The logic in the world, ma, they recommend it. <laughs> no, but even they say that they have some sort of... Memory. Did you hear the expression open marriage that the goyim invented? Right. <laughs> so that means they have a cons consent or from the man. Yeah. You do what you want and I do what I want as long as we don't talk about it too much. <laughs> so where is the logic? The logic is gone. Sdom and Amora, they have their own logic. So the Torah says like this. So Rav Yosef Mikolon, they ask him, is she, maybe she doesn't deserve to be executed. So it says, the tshuva, the answer to your question, is in this pasuk. Lo it doesn't say in a pasuk, umaala ma'al be'ashem. Ma'ala means betrayed. Moel means someone that you gave him money to give to your brother and he keeps it in his pocket. Moel betrayed you. He did not say she betrayed Hashem. It say she betrayed her husband. If we would say she betrayed Hashem, that means the sin is between her and Hashem, you have to give her the benefits of the doubt. Maybe she didn't know. But now the Torah says if she betrayed it on her husband, whether she know or not, it's not relevant anymore. Only sins between us and Hashem, like Shabbat, you have to make sure that the person was aware that he's committing a sin. But between a person to person, whether he knew he's not allowed, whether he didn't know, he broke the glass, he has to pay. It wasn't my fault. I thought it's garbage. Too bad, my friend. You made a damage, you must pay. But I didn't know. Yeah, we know you didn't know. We know. We're not, we're not claiming you're criminal, but you must pay. Same thing over here. So the Gemara says like this. My Mamarim, this bitter water, it's in Sota, page 20. It says like this. Why did Hashem call this, this water bitter water? Shememarerim et aguf. They eat the body from inside. They start with a wound and they kill her from inside. And it says like this, Umacha el amarim. Erase the ink into the bitter water. Now, when we make ink to write Sefer Torah, Tfilin, and Mezuzot, what do we make the ink from? 
the ink that you see on a Sefer Torah has to be natural. What's the ingredients that are used to make this ink? From the animal, right? The answer is, it's called chumtzat mei esh. Chumtza, it's like, uh, it's called vitriol. Do you ever hear about it? Vitriol? V-I-T-R-I-O-L. This is an ingredient, material. The Gemara in Masechet Eruvim, page 13, speaks about it, and also in Megillah, in Gitin. Why do you use this chumtzat mei esh, this vitriol, why? Because it makes it absorb inside the leather, the cloth, the parchment that we use, it's animal skin. It's from the cow. After we remove the hair and put it in lime, it makes it white. Now, in order for the ink to be absorbed inside all the way in, you need to use this may ash. That makes it penetrates the leather and goes all the way in. So it's then very difficult to erase it completely. So it says like this. When they wanted the woman to drink this water, they did not put this vitriol inside. They didn't use may ash. They don't want it to be absorbed inside the cloth. They want it to be erased right away. If they use it, it will not be erased. It would stay on the cloth, the name of Hashem. But it has to be clean. After you take the cloth out of the water, the cloth has to be like brand new. But you don't see any dirt on it. But today, you know, if you take mezuzah and you put it in water, it will become all black. The ink will smear all over. But you cannot, you put it a million times in the water, it will never become white. Even if you rub it, even if you put, uh, you know, anything you want, you cannot, take, you cannot make it white. Why? Some of it absorbed already into the skin, into the leather. It became already a part of it. The question now, and Namash, we're finishing with this. The question is now, why she deserve to get a baby? After all, she's not a decent woman. If her husband suspected her that she went with another man, that means he saw her in a car with him, or isolated in the office, or in the middle of the night in a forest. Something she did that caused suspicion. So already she's a sinner, this woman, Lo Alenu. So why does she now deserve to get a baby if she's barren? Do you know what it is? Or the person will give all his money to have a baby if he's barren. So why does she deserve a prize? It's so one thing she doesn't get killed. No, everyone saw she didn't get killed. She's free. It's like a person was on trial. The judge said, not guilty. He's back on the street. Imagine now they make the, the court in the United States a new law. Everyone who found not guilty in a court of law get from the government a million dollar prize. What happened in this country? <laughs> they choke Obama. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassment. Every criminal who goes to court, it's a very big embarrassment. Even in the end, you find him innocent completely. You don't pay him for the embarrassment. That's it. Whatever happened, happened. You're not guilty. Finished. The fact that they only call you to come to the precinct for questioning or they knock on your door with FBI badge, it's already a huge embarrassment. Even if they ask you about someone else, Bechlal. So the answer is, if the woman did not die, it does not clear her name. People would say, oh, you know why she didn't die? Because her husband is just as bad as her. The husband is not good. That's why the water didn't work on her. Doesn't mean she's clean. She still cheated. But after a few months, when everybody sees she's pregnant, that's clearing her name. But Hashem has to clear her name, after all. Now that she deserves a prize, she deserves shes two big serious smacks she deserves. That's what she deserves. For getting her husband to suspect her. It's already a big thing. But Hashem has honest judgment. Leaving the case pending until the day she died, that's not what he wants. So that's why if she's really innocent, the coin gives her the bracha, and Hashem makes her pregnant, and everybody sees it. And after that, everyone knows that she's clean. That comes to clean her, to finish the whole thing. 
The Rambam writes about Isha Sota. The Rambam writes that the fear in the time of Beta Mikdash, the women had such fear from this water that just from the fear of giving to this horrible horrible ceremony that everybody in Israel now heard that tomorrow she goes to the Kohen and you know it's, it's, the news in the, it's the news in the neighborhood everyone talks about it they were so afraid from that that nobody dared to cheat that's why Hashem made it in the Torah to help the women that have desire to do bad thing to control themselves from the punishment and the embarrassment that they are subject to. That's what I always say. If there would not be punishments in the Torah, maybe we'd have 10 people in the world, minyan of people that keep mitzvot, maybe. The rest say, oh, there's no punishment, so let me do whatever I want. People keep it because they know there's a price to pay. The more you make it clear to them the price is heavy, the more righteous they become. Why? Because they want, not necessarily. Because they consider, what's the, the alternative? I'm going to continue to live secular. And then if everything the Torah is true, and the rabbi just showed me the Torah cannot be written by a human being, that means I'm going to have to pay all these things. So I better wake up today before I'm going to face myself with a disaster in 30 years from now. That's why most people become Shomrei Mitzvot. Once in a while, you have a, an angel, a pure soul, that doesn't need the punishment to motivate him. Most people, the fear of the punishment is like a gun on their, rock, on their head. You know, by the goyim, they used to make similar laws to this, the goyim. The laws of Hammurabi, you heard about Hammurabi? He was a, he was a rabbi means rabbi, Hamor means donkey. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. It says like this, in the old days in Babel, Babylon, a woman that they suspected her for cheating on her husband by the goyim, they used to throw her to the court of heaven. How? How? She has to jump into water. Water, deep water. If she drowns, it's a sign that she made a sin. If she did not drown, that means she did not make the sin. Where is it? Hammurabi, uh, uh, provision 132. The laws of Hammurabi by the Goyim. Well, what happened if she doesn't know how to swim? They didn't think about that part. <laughs> 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 In Europe, you expect them to be a little more advanced than Babel, no? Than Iraq. In Europe, they did it the opposite. What? A woman that they suspected her for cheating, they tied her, they tied her hands and legs behind her back, and they threw her to the water. They say, if she drowned, that means she's innocent. If she got out of the water, that means she's a witch. <laughs> she did black magic. <laughs> One way or the other, she died, even if she's innocent. <laughs> I guess they give her an award after she died. We killed you, but now we're going to put you a beautiful <laughs> picture. You know? They made her a nice funeral. Oh, it's easier. After that, they fell bad, so they made her a nice funeral. <laughs> you know, today, if you tell a woman, we want you to walk on the street with no clothes, even the most not decent women will think a million times before they do it. It's not something that a woman that makes a lot of scenes, still when it comes to this on the street to walk like this, she'll think a million times. There, there was something that happened in a city of Militos. Women started to commit suicide. It became in fashion. Like today in Israel, every Israeli makes tattoos. It's in fashion now. Now it was a new fashion. Women don't like their life, they kill themselves. And they try to make it stop and they cannot. No matter what they tell them, they kill themselves, they don't care. 
So they published from now on, every woman who would commit suicide will be buried in her funeral completely naked. They'll put her body on a bed. She won't be covered. The entire people of the funeral will see her like that. And that's how they're going to bury her. She won't be covered in tachrichim or in a bag or in a coffin. After that, not one woman committed suicide. So to commit suicide, which is an actual murder, they were not afraid. But that their body will be displayed naked after they died in front of the people of the funeral, that one they couldn't tolerate. <laughs> That's, by the way, a great idea to do it to the Palestinian murderers. You have to publish that every one of them who participate in act of terror, when he dies or commits suicide, you bury him in a bag that made from the skin of the pig. Because the Arabs hate pigs very much. How they, why they hate pig? Because they saw in the Torah that Hashem said that pig is extra impure, extra. So they can eat it, but they also, everything that relates to chazir, they call it chanzir, the Arab. Not chazir, chanzir. I don't know where the noon came from. But if you tell an Arab, we bury you in the skin of the, of the pig, he believes that because of that, he doesn't go to heaven. That he just murdered innocent little cute children, is now worried not to go to heaven. But if they put him in a bag made from chazir, he's not going to go to heaven. So why the Israelis are so dumb? And what are they waiting for? They have to make everyone who shoot or throw rockets, whatever, if he died, you put him right away and showed to the whole world and everyone in Gaza would see how the Israeli put him inside the Chazir together with the head of the Chazir kissing his mouth <laughs> like this and putting him in the ground and Shalom Aleich Nafshi. After that, no more committing suicide. Great idea. Great idea. Why are they not doing it? Most of them do like these suicide bombings, so if you do hard things actually bury them. Doesn't matter. Even if they're not suicide, the soldier killed him in the middle of battle, you put him in a chazir. Ah. I wanted also to speak about a monk, Nazir, and Birkat Kohanim. But time ran out. We'll do it maybe in another time. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen. Ve Amen.